Thought Leadership from PwC. All of this uncertainty is tough, and sometimes it will not go as expected. Being clear about lessons learned along the way and the adjustments needed, and doing that in a way that is transparent with, without losing confidence mm-hmm. that we've got it. Coming to you with a look at what's top of mind for CEOs in 2023, this is PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and thanks so much for joining us today. 40% of global CEOs think their organizations will no longer be economically viable in 10 years' time if it continues on its current course. That stark data point underscores a dual imperative facing 4,410 CEOs from 105 countries and territories who responded to PwC's 26th annual Global CEO Survey. Most of those CEOs feel it's critically important for them to reinvent their businesses for the future, but they also face daunting near-term challenges, starting with the global economy, which nearly 75% believe will see declining growth during 2023. So as we round the bend towards the end of 2023's first quarter, we thought today was a good time to zoom out to the broader business environment that finance organizations are navigating. Between a tightening money supply, inflation, and ongoing demands from investors and stakeholders to grow in a sustainable way, we wanted to ask, how are companies managing? What are their near-term and long-term priorities? And how are these changing in the current environment? Our guest today is here to discuss those questions and more. Back on the podcast, I'd like to welcome Wes Fricker, PwC's U.S. Vice Chair and Trust Solutions Co-Leader. Wes brings a wide array of perspectives, not only from his business leadership within PwC, but also from the conversations that he's having with our clients on a daily basis. With that, here's my discussion with Wes. So Wes, welcome back. So nice to have you on the podcast. Nice to have you in person. Well, thank you, Heather. It's wonderful to be back with you and everyone in our listening audience. All right. So Wes, obviously there's been so much that's been happening in the markets since we chatted last and we've seen tough decisions around layoffs. We're seeing uncertainty in the banking sector. Uh, Obviously, you and I have been spending a lot of time talking about the upcoming ESG reporting rules, which our audience definitely knows about. And of course, we're also seeing companies right now wrap up their first quarters and so I was saying this to some one of our other guests, it feels like since COVID, every few weeks has been something new and that trend is continuing. Maybe 2024 will be better. But in any event, I know you spend a lot of time talking to our clients. So from your perspective and from what you're hearing, what is sort of top of mind right now? Heather, I think you've got it exactly right. There's three big areas. And this is a period where all three of them include uncertainty. What are the three? Market uncertainty. The second is operational uncertainty. And then the third is financial uncertainty. And oftentimes business leaders will need to navigate one or two of those three. This is a period where you're really navigating uncertainty on all three of them. And so that requires a tremendous amount of coordination, communication, all of the core basics of really navigating through the storm with a strong footing today in order to set yourself up for a longer term future. So market, operational, and financial risks, managing them today requires the best execution that you could think of. And when you look at those three different risks, do you see it tilting one direction or another, or it really has to, you really have to keep your eye on all three right now? Well, I think it, it, as with many things, business model uh, will, will cause you to, to be more, um, more significantly indexed to one or two of those risks. You, you mentioned banking for one or technology in the technology sector. Execution is really important. Um, healthcare, there's a lot of scientific change in that area. So staying focused on what's, what's happening in your operations. Do you have the right supply chain? Do you have the right talent mix in order to deliver? So it really does depend on what is the business model today, but also what is the business model in the future? Because what we see is a lot of industries coming together. 
technology is impacting nearly every business model, for example. Well, it's interesting because earlier today I was interviewing uh, Craig Stromberg and Zain Siddiqui from our um, you know, PwC Intelligence, and we're releasing their podcast next week. But one of the things they were talking about was really focusing in on risk. And so in your sort of three categories of risk, any that you would emphasize, maybe starting with market. Within the market area, scenario planning is really important. Because market risks come at you largely in areas where you don't control the risk. You don't control the market, but you can control how you respond to it. And responding to it really gets to scenario planning. What are the possibilities that could happen? Am I prepared operationally? Am I prepared financially for those scenarios? Have I gone through a tabletop exercise, for example, if I'm exposed to liquidity risk? Have I gone through a, a, a good process of looking at foreign currency exposure, for example, for some companies that have significant cross-border activities? Maybe they have an extended supply chain. It's really going through those scenarios, both across the management team and with the board, that helps us then be much more resilient around risks that we don't control, but we can control our response. On operations, oftentimes there's a lot of it that we do control. We control, for example, our CapEx spending in R&D. We control large-scale transformations to make sure we get to the outcomes that we're counting on. And that's an area where what, what I see management teams really doing is, is having an effective sort of check and challenge process built into their plans. Have we thought about, for example, an outside-in look to make sure that we're planning for operational risks and then controlling whether it's human capital that we need or more capacity or more focus across the team? On the financial side, really being clear-minded about where we are financially, the, the liquidity and the resources that we need in relation to the business going forward, being really realistic about that. Um, and having sort of the classic strong CFO voice, the truth teller voice across the management team. Uh, what do we need to do in terms of pricing? What do we need to do in terms of volume? What do we need to do in terms of capital structure in order to advance the business? So I don't want to give away my whole podcast with Craig and Zane, but I do have a question from something our listeners will hear them talking about next week. And it's talking about risks that almost that you, I don't want to say can't anticipate because their point was you should. But for example, COVID in a way was something people kind of knew and yet no one really anticipated. And are you seeing sort of in the wake of that, in the wake of all of these things that just keep occurring, that management teams are trying to cast the net wider? Or how are you seeing companies think about that? It's a wonderful question. You know, there's there's a lot of risks that are are hard to anticipate, even harder to manage, perhaps. But nonetheless, what I see really strong management teams doing with the support of their board is encouraging a dissenting view, encouraging a diverse perspective to really come into the conversation and to connect dots in different ways. And that requires courage and confidence across a management team to be willing to go through that process. And you may feel uncomfortable as you work your way through that process, but undoubtedly you come out the other end with a much more complete perspective about what the opportunities are, but also what the risks are. Because much of our discussion here is focused on what are the risks and downside? There's an equal conversation about the positive side of it. What are the value and opportunities that we should be aiming for today, sort of running the race to achieve winning outcomes over the next series of years? Because as much time as we need to spend today on managing risk, getting through uncertainty, we also need to have a clear-minded view on where we're going in order to allocate capital to achieve those outcomes in the future. And that's where business model reinvention really comes in to achieve sustainability of the business going forward. 
So that's actually probably a perfect lead in to my next question. And it's interesting because uh, the reason I asked you on the podcast to begin with was to talk about the results of our 2023 global CEO survey. And then yet we've had all these other things happen. So I know we're going to go in a few directions, but I think this reinvention point is a key point that came from that survey. So can you maybe level set for our listeners some of those facts and then we'll, we'll walk through them? That's right. We, um, we, we did, as we oftentimes do with, with CEOs, on an annual basis, we, we pulled them together in the context of a survey. 4,400 CEOs responded to the survey in 2022. And what was really fascinating about the voice of the CEO is that on the one hand, there was a degree of pessimism across the CEO community about the markets more generally. What's interesting about that, so 78% said, we see tough times ahead. But when you talk to CEOs about their business, there's a healthy degree of optimism. Why is that? Because management teams and CEOs don't get paid to sort of watch their business go the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Management teams get paid for growth, margin expansion, and value creation. And, and so it, it's, it's interesting, sort of the survey at, on the whole, and then the optimism across the C-suite within, within management teams. So Wes, you're almost saying CEOs are looking around and saying, no, no, things look not great for everyone else, but we're headed in the right direction. But we can do it. The, the, the optimism, I think, is important mm-hmm, because the too. way companies show up with their teams to motivate through tough times is massively important. Companies have to believe that they can win in order to win. Just the same, if companies lose faith in their future, you're probably looking at a change of a management team at that point. So, so optimism is really important. The second piece that came through the survey, which was striking, is that 40% of CEOs said that they anticipate that their business model would not be economically viable in the next 10 years. So as CEOs looked over the 10-year time horizon, essentially they saw the need to reinvent. You need to reinvent in order to stay economically viable. Again, back to the point that management teams get paid in order to generate value and preserve value. They don't get paid to just sit on their laurels and watch the business deteriorate. And, and so that, that's where optimism meets action. Business reinvention is all about taking action in order to advance the company. And, and those, those areas that were really driving the view about economic viability really starts with transformation with most customers. The way companies are engaging with their customers on the sales side, the distribution side, what is the value being promised? There's a lot of change in that area. The expectations, if you just think about what, what we as individual consumers, for example, expect through um, through technology, as we engage in products or services, as we look for value, it's changed dramatically. Companies are now adjusting, whether it's a business to consumer platform or business to business platform, companies are adjusting to that. So that was one of the key areas. So as if I put those, I'll call it three things together. So broadly, They're pessimistic when they look around and they think that their own business probably needs to reinvent and redevelop over the next 10 years, but they're optimistic that they are able to do that. Is that sort of putting those pieces together? That's a really good synthesis, Heather. The, um, that optimism then also carries into all of the work needed in transforming the way a business operates. So this is, this is not a top line transformation and reinvention. This is a reinvention of the core delivery of a company. Maybe it's to manage a cost structure. Maybe it's to manage supply chain risk and, and, and make a company much more resilient. Maybe it's to uh, diversify funding and other financial resources. So the work 
in just the core of operations is also significant. But one of the one of the nuggets coming through the survey in that area, companies and CEOs were generally preserving their human capital. The talent war is tough, and certainly within different industries, different pockets, you see some layoffs in order to manage cost structure. But on the whole, CEOs see the importance of retaining top talent in order to accomplish the objectives of the business. So let me follow up on that one, because we did this survey last year in the fall. And then now since then, we have seen lots and lots of announced layoffs, probably getting more headlines maybe than they really are uh, the, the true impact on the economy, just given the companies and otherwise. And so you're saying you, you can reconcile those two points of view because big picture, these announced layoffs are, are relatively small. Is that fair? Or how do you reconcile that? It's a great question. It's the reason why companies are laying off uh, human capital. It tends to be that they've digitized business processes. They've digitized aspects of their business to free up capacity. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they have excess, uh, excess human capital, excess people uh, that are reallocated to other businesses. So in, in that way, it's, of course, an adjustment for any given company in terms of what it needs in order to be successful in the current operating environment. But broadly speaking, the recognition that people are critical to business and value creation going forward, that concept still stands. So on that point, though, so people are critical. And yet, if so I'm sure some of the people listening are thinking reinvention, transformation, I've already been through everything I've been through the past three or four years, even I don't know if I'm hybrid, I'm back at work, uh, you know, business just seems like there's a lot more change right now. And so do you, it sounds like in the survey, at least we found that CEOs are optimistic that their workforce can handle what's coming their direction. I, I would say on the whole, that's true. The search for top talent is still very intense. Just in my travels across uh, business leaders and conversations, the search for talent that is able to navigate through change, to find stability in a moment of uncertainty, mm -hmm. to inspire teams, to sort of rally a, an, an entire team to accomplish um, bigger, greater reinventions like that search for talent is still out there. The search for leadership. All right. So it sounds like for our listeners, depending on where you are in the organization, there's opportunity for you too. If you can be that positive force for change instead of the one dragging your feet against what's coming. Yeah, that that's right. And then I think business leaders also see the obligation that they have to, um, to everyone to not leave people behind. So if we're providing upskilling in digital technologies, if, if we're providing retraining, that, that is approaching the discussion with a no one left behind attitude. Now, of, of course, some may decide to, uh, to, to move or, or reshape their, mm -hmm. their careers differently or in a different timeline, et cetera. But part of leadership here is in understanding the human side of business. It's not just just about sort of the mechanics of it. Um, there's there's a real human side to business as well. So that also leads then to my next question, which we've spent a lot of time talking about sustainability reporting. Social is obviously human capital. How do you see the ESG concepts impacting this reinvention? And is it still more um, hype or are you actually seeing it integrate into what companies are doing as you're talking to people? Yeah, I, I'm seeing business leaders integrated into their business model. ESG or climate transition or human capital reporting or cyber reporting. Mm -hmm. There are a number of different areas of addition of non-financial reporting. That's important to understand progress and performance of transitions. Take energy, for example. Climate transition may involve re-engineering products, re-engineering the delivery of services to be much more sustainable 
in the in the way those are executed. So some companies are reporting publicly the amount of R&D expenditures that are driven through sustainability. Those are important metrics then for investors, other capital providers, and even employees to understand the pace and the intensity of reinvestment in the business to understand whether the company is well prepared, not just for today, but but over the longer term. So I, I am seeing a continued integration of ESG metrics into the business model so that users of that information can better understand what's actually occurring not only at the top of the organization strategically, but also in the middle parts and the smallest, most distant parts of a business. Is it really being transformed? Are we really achieving the the sustainability that we all anticipate? And then Wes, a follow-up question to that is that ESG inherently in some ways is like a long term. We started the podcast talking about very immediate, right? The the issues going on in banking, continued supply chain, which I think three years ago we thought we would not still be talking about. So many things like that. How are you seeing um, CFOs really devote their time between that? I have this immediate crisis and yet I also have to think about 10 years from now to make sure I'm reinvented and I have to think about the clim- climate, you know, so many competing priorities. Right. CFOs are increasingly taking on the connection of individual functions, different operational areas, because it, it's really in understanding the operational areas that a CFO can also communicate about the financial performance of the enterprise. So it, I, I think of it broadly as CFOs being air traffic controllers. Um, or operational CFOs. They have to not only manage uh, takeoffs and landings, they have to manage what's happening on the ground. They have to manage the uncertainty of weather patterns, which is outside of their control. They have to manage the the operations of the tower to make sure that, that the right people are there, the right expertise is being represented. And then they have to communicate. They have to communicate not only with pilots, They also have to communicate with others flying through the airspace. So naturally, you can see I spend a lot of time in airports (laughs) these days. But it's it's that notion that a lot of things are coming together for the CFO or the office of the CFO, which is important to delivering on the financial performance of a company, the position, the financial position of that company, and maintaining cash flows and liquidity. So all of that comes together sort of in a central way. That's why I say today more than ever, the operational CFO Mm -hmm. is someone who has their their hands in many operational areas to manage risk, to identify opportunities, to evaluate deals, to evaluate dispositions, to evaluate reporting of capital raises and periodic reporting and the confidence building externally and with the board, much of that's coming together with the CFO. Well, I definitely think many of our listeners will like the analogy to air traffic control. If nothing else, it shows the importance of our role as accountants and and finance, which I think sometimes, you know, that seems pure back office, but I think you emphasize there the importance. But when you were just describing all the things CFOs are thinking about now, are you seeing then in practice that they're changing the staffing of their organizations? You talked before about top talent and the like, but how about the skills that they're looking for? The, the skill set of the CFO, finance organization, corporate controller, further down, continues to uh, incorporate digital skills as a core backbone, as a, as a core capability. That digital skill set to achieve much greater efficiency in the execution of the day-to-day. But then increasingly, an operational understanding. For example, do we understand technology? Do we understand um, engineering, if that's relevant to the business model? Do we understand science and the way that uh, products or services are, are being shaped going forward? And then bringing that, those operational aspects into the discussion of CapEx. Do we know where we need to allocate capital 
And are we getting the outcomes that we anticipated? Do we have the return on our investment that we anticipated? By the way, are we meeting our compliance obligations along the way, whether it's ESG reporting mm -hmm. um, or it might even be tax reporting on different attributes like carbon and so forth. So really the skill sets that come together for a CFO include a much wider set of capabilities that go well beyond just finance. Right, definitely. And I think that's a helpful perspective. So let me take us back to the survey for a moment, because I think one of the things, you know, you made the point at the beginning, this is a global survey, an amazing number of responses when, you know, you would think about it, how hard it is to get those. But did we see any differences regionally as we kind of look around the globe? Obviously, many of the issues are global, but there's definitely regional flavors of some of them. We, we did see some, um, some regional variations. Uh, for example, in Africa, Brazil, China, more stability there. Uh, we, we saw a greater degree of optimism in the U.S. But then we also saw uh, sector and industry level variations. Uh, technology, health industries impacted by reinvention at a much greater speed and intensity than some of the other traditional uh, industries. So that that is the pace of knowledge, the pace of reinvention um, is moving at different, pace, at different levels of intensity across sectors, but this impacts everyone. Everyone has some aspect that's impacting their business. And I think that was the consistency we saw across the CEO survey. And Wes, you may not have this answer at your fingertips, but I'll ask any big differences from last year in terms of maybe this optimism or, or any of these other questions? Yeah, year over year, we, we saw generally a shift from optimism to a bit more pessimism. We saw the reality of, of sort of the macro uh, you know, geopolitical landscape mm -hmm. impacting supply chain risk, perceptions of cyber, um, but but also um, the understanding of the the sales cycle and the distribution chain. Where are my customers? Are they local or are they abroad? So it it did impact year over year, sort of the 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 ambition, the scope of the ambition of management teams. And then as you're looking at, you know, I know you've, there's a lot of digging into the data. Any other key takeaways but that we haven't already touched on here? I, I think we hit um, the, the big parts of it. But one of, the, um, one of the just stepping back year over year, inflation is high on the agenda. Macroeconomic volatility, high on the agenda. Geopolitical cyber, climate, those were there last year. And, and so across those macro themes, driving more information, more communication across the management team, and then from the management team to the board for evaluation and confidence building that we've got it under control, we've had enough debate and dialogue. That's really where I see business leaders who are leaning into this discussion. Across all of that, of course, is the need to maintain trust. How do you maintain trust in a world where surprises can arise? And it requires the humility to be clear about what went well, what didn't, and what you'll change going forward. And that process of communication in today's market, I think, is increasingly important because businesses will be judged on whether they're building trust when trust is really the currency of business. And how, for companies that you think are doing this well, what are some of the sort of key principles that you see them following? Yeah, I, I would say the, the key principle of candor, truth-telling, also the principle of humility, being clear that all of this uncertainty is tough. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it will not go as expected being clear about lessons learned along the way and the adjustments needed and doing that in a way that is transparent with without losing confidence mm -hmm. that we've got it collectively as a management team of business leaders we've got this but also being open 
to the feedback when adjustments are needed that we actually put action behind it. it requires more than just words. It requires real action in order to move forward. Well, and I think to your point, being able to show a focus on a long-term goal and yet the short-term maybe is going a little differently than planned. Balancing those two things, can, it can be difficult for a leader to do that without seeming like they're just kind of whipshawing back and forth. That, that's right. Context around time horizon is really important here. Um, what, what I have heard many leaders talk about is the importance of, of keeping the next two years in mind. What are we working on? Today, what will we need in order to deliver outcomes in the next period, but then also the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. So it's the two-year horizon, the 10-year horizon. Oftentimes, today's issues take away our ability to focus on the next 10 whenever the next 10 requires course correction and reinvention in order to really preserve value over that longer-term horizon. And, and so... The management point there is to make sure we have the right capacity to achieve both because they're, they're, it's a prioritization question. Mm -hmm. do, do we have enough time and attention in our day-to-day -to, -day to land both of those successfully? All the while anticipating also in a 10-year horizon, you may go through management changes. You may go through changes at the board, and so you need stability through succession planning as well, mm -hmm. so that the entire team understands where we are today, where we're heading over the next 10 years, and as new voices come into the leadership table or the boardroom, those voices understand the context of decisions made, and they can add to it with the context of lessons learned uh, to, to shape things going forward. So succession planning, capacity and alignment across the team are three really important management points as we go forward. So it's, it's interesting because you talk about two years and 10 years, and yet one of the things we've been talking about is the fact that a lot of companies are making commitments that are you know, 20 or 30 years off, particularly in the area of climate, but I think we're going to start seeing it more and more, biodiversity and otherwise, with some of the recent developments. So how... How do companies reconcile that? And where does, for example, climate commitments fit into this discussion? I'm so glad you, you, you raised that because it's, it's true. It, it's a reality that in order to make progress on macro items like greenhouse gas emissions, the time horizon for transformation includes both operational change as well as scientific discovery. So the time horizon can often be decades, but we don't have decades to wait mm -hmm. to take action. We need to take action today. So how do you sort of balance time horizons? What I've seen leaders do is really start with that long-term perspective, maybe it's 30 years into the future, and then to sort of chunk it up. What's my, what's my two-year plan? What's my CapEx plan? Maybe that's five, seven, or even 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then what's the plan beyond that in terms of my suppliers, my distribution, my business operations, geographies? And that inevitably brings scenario planning right to the forefront. You might do some modeling around climate changes, the way it will impact where people live, mm -hmm. where resources are provided, how that impacts energy uh, supply and diversification within the context of your business. All of that requires long range planning. So oftentimes, if, if you just have the discussion about what well, will be net zero in 2040 or 2050, it's, it's easy to just have words and little action. What I see leading teams do is really put plans in place for action today with the long term goals in mind and a board that really focuses on accountability and performance today in order to, to achieve those long-term objectives. So it's interesting because you talked there about scenario analysis. I know it came up before, 
One of the things we've been spending time talking about is influence, because some companies may have a lot of influence on some parts of the focus on greenhouse gas, and then not much otherwise. And so that is where scenarios come in. But do you see companies sort of recognizing that there's some things they, they can manage and some they can't? Or how, how are they dealing with that uncertainty? I, I think it all starts with um, good analytical rigor around what can we control, what is not in our control, or said another way, what is not yet in our control. And, and so first being clear about what is what is the destination look like? Maybe it's 20, 30, 40, or, mm-hmm. or 50. What does that destination look like? And then shrinking the time horizon to the, a, a much nearer term set of priorities operationally. From there, looking at the CapEx, what does it really take? And do our capital providers understand the context of our business model, the investments that we anticipate, and whether we will create sustainable value? Because really good management teams see both the value and opportunity side of this as well as the risk management side of this. So this, this isn't about allocating capital for no return, this is about allocating capital and getting a return from that. So the financial model becomes really important. And then the reporting and communications model also is important. When I, I saw some stats the other day, 97% of US companies are reporting sustainability, which might include a net zero commitment, for example, 97%. But across all of those, the level of confidence in those reported numbers is still lagging. So there's a lot more work to do on the reporting piece in order to build confidence that the decisions we take today as business leaders are really translating into action. Well, so I think you anticipated my next question because I did want to ask you, I know coming from your background that you see the value of reporting. And I think we've talked before about the value of sustainability reporting other, you know, other types of non-financial reporting. So how do you see companies really taking advantage of telling their story, using reporting in a beneficial way instead of just like yet another compliance exercise? I love this question because if it's just a compliance exercise, management teams are missing the real opportunity here. The opportunity is to present a strategy and a vision for the business. What do we see that? Where, where do we see an opportunity for pricing? Where do we see an opportunity for a better operating leverage, a better operating model with with a different cost structure. Mm -hmm. Where do we see those opportunities? So increasingly what companies are are doing, they're being very specific about the investments that they're making, for example, in sustainability, and communicating how they fit into the overall system. Maybe it's a supply chain they fit into and they're producing materials that are ready for um, equipment that runs on electricity, for example. Maybe they've diversified their their offerings and they get premium pricing. So being really clear about where we're investing, how we're allocating capital, then achieves a greater stability of outside financial capital coming into the business. Better liquidity, better pricing of financial capital, and better returns over time. Like the markets, the markets have a thirst for high quality information in order to support pricing of securities, pricing of capital, and an evaluation of performance. The markets give us a tremendous amount of feedback about what's working well, what's resonating in business, and what's not. And so real management, leading management teams have their eyes peeled for that feedback and they incorporate that into their corporate planning. But then it sounds like what you're also saying is companies need to have discipline to figure out which of these factors are most influential for their company and not, for example, you said a new product, not 
create, let's call it a green product, and then not know the pricing or not know what the market wants, but really to hone in on that and then to use that reporting to their advantage. Really well said that that if sustainability or ESG is just something we do on the side in a silo, we're probably missing the real promise of it. Because what we're not then doing is incorporating into every aspect of our business model, every aspect of our business decisioning, and then the reporting that flows from that. So we're, what we're not then doing is redesigning our products in a way that incorporates what's important to our consumer mm-hmm. base. We're not re-engineering our cost structure to be long-term competitive. And we're not providing information to our capital providers that enables us to plug into long-term stable capital. Yeah, so this almost goes back to then your two-year, 10-year, and then I'll say beyond horizon. But if I look then at the, the overall themes of what you've ta- you're talking about, the right human capital and the right talent is the key, it seems like, to all of this. Because if you don't have the right people, you could have a great plan, but no one to execute you may have executors, no plan. Like there's so many problematic scenarios. So again, what are you seeing from a sort of a talent perspective that companies should be focused on? That is such a great point to pull together on this, that increasingly business leaders want to work with companies that are cons- that, that have a long-term view and are able to execute. What I found is that ESG becomes a tool for helping to communicate to the best talent in the marketplace that we have a sustained or sustainable future, that that we're creating value even as expectations shift around the role and the responsibility of business. That's where top talent, whether it's science or technology or engineering, even finance, and management talent, that's where it tends to converge. And so plugging into top talent helps to create the differentiation that produces sustainable value. Well, and I think, Wes, maybe on that point of top talent, I do think there's often a focus on, I'll call it the the back office or other parts of the organization. But one of the benefits I think companies can get from sustainability is that all parts of your human capital, whether it's the frontline employee that just made your best customer mad or, you know, or otherwise, like all parts of the organization, you need to be focusing on that talent. And I think that kind of, again, fits in with some of these other themes. It's, it's a great point that when, when we say top talent, it can be at any level of an organization and across different functions and activities, that the value of, a, of an enterprise is alignment across the entire assembled workforce that those those people may be working for the company in ge- different geographies, different labor markets, different cultures, different customs. They they may be um, they may be in different functional uh, backgrounds. They may be full time and part time and virtual and flexible. Mm-hmm. And and so the leadership capacity to pull that all together to provide a shared purpose a common inclusive approach to um, to working and achieving and delivering that purpose like that's the that's the capacity of real business leaders to really make that a reality and i think that's that's where many companies are on a journey it's hard mm-hmm. like it's hard to produce that outcome consistently day in and day out but still that's that's the work we have in front of us that's the that's the opportunity to create a real difference for everyone within the organization well so Wes I'm going to take that back then sort of full circle to one of the things we said at the beginning which is you talked about the voice of the CFO 
And you also made a good point about dissension and how companies, you know, leaders need to be willing to kind of give the tough message. And then you also reference air traffic controllers. So if I put that all together, and I think anyone in finance who's listening knows you often are the bearer of bad news. You often do have to give the different point of view. Maybe you're reporting ESG statistics that the rest of the company doesn't like. I mean, there's so many different things. So how do you see... CFOs balancing, they need to be inspiring. They need to be part of an, you know, a highly functioning leadership team and being willing sometimes to be contrarian. I think it really comes down to trust. CFOs need to earn the trust of everyone around them, whether it's inside the company or outside. And they earn that trust by listening carefully, but then also speaking and taking action. So back to the air, air mm-hmm. traffic controller, if, if someone needs to come in for an emergency landing, CFOs have to clear the runway. But also CFOs have to be direct and firm if the airspace is unsafe as a result of weather. And that may mean planes are grounded. That may mean a lot of passengers are unhappy but air traffic controllers have the responsibility for safety. There's a clarity of purpose. There's a clarity of objective, which is keeping everyone safe. It's that, it's that communication that then builds trust over time with the consistency and clarity of purpose of understanding how we made the decision we made, what the outcomes were, what we learned as a result of it and the feedback being humble enough to listen for feedback. All right. Well, I I think considering you're the leader of our trust practice, probably ending our podcast on a message of trust is a good good place. But I will give a last question of any other thoughts that you wanted to share today. Well, Heather, I want to thank you and all of our colleagues in the opportunity to speak much more broadly on this point of trust, because trust really is the currency of business. Others have said it's the capital of business. Trust is an opportunity as business leaders to really build confidence that we've got this. And I am optimistic. We've got this. As uncertain as the world is in terms of the marketplace, operational change, financial resources, we've got this. All right. Well, that's definitely a positive note after sort of negative notes at the beginning of our podcast. So Wes, really appreciate you joining me. Thanks for all the insight. Thanks very much, Heather. That's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.